Father, as we've uh, gathered uh, this morning, um, we've uh, come with uh, having had all kinds of uh, different weeks. Um, for some, life uh, is going well and we're feeling content and, and pleased and happy. And for others, uh, life is really difficult. Um, for many of our folk, um, not even able to be here today uh, because of COVID and flus and, and colds. Uh, but we ask in, in your kindness now, as we have your uh, word open before us, uh, please uh, teach us, uh, feed us and nourish our souls and and give uh, joy to our lives, we pray through your word. And we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to begin uh, with uh, this question. How forgetful are you? How's your memory going? You know, there are plenty of everyday uh, moments that pass by and barely register a note in our consciousness. Um, do you remember what you watched on television last week? Do you remember what you ate for dinner Wednesday three weeks ago? Uh, do you recall all the conversations you had? Now, on the other hand, if you had a car accident last month, I suspect you remember that uh, vividly. Uh, I suspect if you started a new job two weeks ago, you still recall your first day. If you got married yesterday, I'm sure you remembered the day. You know, Nadal won the French Open just last week. I'm pretty sure it hasn't slipped his memory. Now, our memories are, are, are a funny thing, aren't they? We may remember or rather not remember some of the, the little things, the everyday things that happen all of the time, but the big things, the the important moments, the, the traumatic events, they tend to stick with us, don't they? Now, nostalgia is something slightly different. Uh, nostalgia is a sentimental longing for the past. It's based on a memory that we formulated that, that filters through these coloured glasses of happiness. So we remember the good old days, the, the golden years, wherever they may have been. I think it's one of the reasons why the, the Netflix series Stranger Things is so popular. I really like, the, I don't know if you've seen it or not, I enjoy Stranger Things. I don't like horror shows, but I love Stranger Things. And I love it because it brings back all these you know, nostalgic memories for me, all, all these connections with my childhood when I was growing up in the 1980s, the, the, the fashion or the, the bicycles that I would ride or the music. The, the Soviet Union, the monsters, it just brings back all these memories for me. And, but you see, nostalgia offers us this distorted picture of the past. It remembers the good things, the happy moments, and it tends to block out the rest. And nostalgia does even more. Uh, one philosopher writes, In nostalgia, one sacrifices the present and the possibility of the future as one squats in the past. Nostalgia implies that God is present in one moment and not another, or more perniciously, that one prefers to be in a previous unlivable moment more than one uh, that God has brought us to now. Well, in Exodus chapter 16, we find the Israelites are suffering a bad case of memory loss and nostalgia. Now, the chapter begins, look with me, in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around with pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you've brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Now, what are they talking about? <laughs> the Israelites have experienced centuries of slavery and brutal oppression. We know that. We've been reading about it, haven't we? They had experienced it. And with their own eyes, they've just witnessed God's power to rescue them. They've lived through the ten plagues. They've gone through that night of the Passover. They themselves with their hands, collected all their belongings and joined hundreds of thousands of men and women and children and animals and they crossed the Red Sea together. They could smell the salt waters or the parted waters and then they watched God's enemies being swallowed up in the waves. They've just seen all of that. And it's only been six weeks since those events. And now they're grumbling and moaning and complaining and wishing they're back in Egypt. 
They're saying to each other, hey, do you remember the good old days back in Egypt? We had so much food to eat. We had comfortable homes to live in, wonderful working conditions. No, no, you didn't. Now, grumbling, this idea of grumbling, grumbling's about unbelief. Instead of remembering God's promise, they're turning to unbelief. They have stopped believing what God says. Grumbling is also ingratitude. It's, I'm looking at my situation and I'm not satisfied with it, God. God, I deserve better than what you're giving me. And, and because of that, grumbling is also an attack on God. It's saying, God, you've let me down. God, I can't trust you. I wonder how often do we grumble? Now, we see in the book of Exodus that grumbling is not a minor complaint, something that it's okay to do from time to time. Grumbling becomes the reason why Israel doesn't enter the promised land for 40 years. So by the end of Exodus, they're on the verge of entering the promised land. And the spies have been looking around the land and they come back to the people and they report the good news. The land is rich. It's fertile. Look at the size of the grapes. They are enormous. The food, it's just amazing. And then the spies also mention the size of the people who are inhabiting the land and a bit taller than the average Israelite. Right? And, and the Israelites groan and they complain, they grumble. And God says, okay, this generation will never enter my promised land, my rest. Instead, your bones are going to be buried in the sands and only after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness will the new generation be allowed to come into the land and take possession of it. Uh, we warned about grumbling in the New Testament as well. In the book of James, don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Uh, Mike, uh, as you know, and like many people at, recently at church, uh, Mike had uh, COVID uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he was trying to because he had a few things to do, do still at church, and so we're trying to hand over some things. And he said, Murray, my, my brain is just really foggy at the moment. It's one of apparently the side effects of, of COVID, and I thought, it's kind of normal. It, 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 extra foggy, Mike, right? And, and, and he said, and he couldn't think clearly and make clear decisions and remember all the stuff that he wanted to share with me. And, and friends, that's what grumbling does. It distorts your vision. It stops you from looking clearly it fogs the memory. And that's what's going on here. Now, as the people of God are journeying through the desert, the going is slow. I mean, there may be 600,000 people. It takes a long time to get from one place to another, doesn't it? The conditions aren't easy. It's a hot, arid environment. And you see, the people of Israel are in this in-between place right now. They're between Egypt and the Promised Land. God has rescued them from our slavery in Egypt, but they're not yet in that land flowing with milk and honey. Now, they're not in this upside-down world as you get in like Stranger Things, but they are in this in-between place between redemption and home. God has redeemed them, but they're not yet home. They're in this in-between place. You can, might like to think about it as a, an aeroplane journey. Uh, in the, the Ben Affleck uh, movie Argo, Affleck plays the role of a CIA agent and he's tasked with the, the, the rescue of a group of American diplomats who are hiding out uh, in uh, Iran. So the Iranian, this is during the Iranian Revolution, um, what, 40 years ago, uh, and uh, so the American embassy had been taken over by the Iranian um, guards and, and, and a group of revolutionaries, but some of the diplomats were able to escape and went into hiding. Anyway, and so he comes into uh, Iran and, he, and he's able to rescue them and he comes up with a plan and they, got, they have to take a flight out of Iran. So they've got fake passports, it's all set up and they've got the tickets and so on. And anyway, at, toward the end of the movie, there is this scene where the, the, there's this building tension. The diplomats are finally in the aircraft. They're in the aeroplane. They're, they're, they're taking off. You can just see the sweat pouring off their, their, their faces and, and attention. As they, are they going to be caught? Can they get out of this? Will they be discovered? And for these tense minutes, though, the plane takes off from the airport and it's, and it's ascending into the clouds. And then after a few minutes, 
they're told by the pilot that they've left Iranian airspace. And then you just see the, the, the joy on their faces. You know, we're safe. <laughs> we're finally safe. We've been saved. But the, the travel hasn't finished, though, has it? They've just left the tarmac. They've just left Iranian airspace. But it's still hours to go before they're home again in the United States, you see. And so they were in this in-between place between safety and home. And here in Exodus, Israel is in that in-between space. God has rescued them. They're out of the land of Egypt, but they're not yet in the promised land. And friends, we as Christians are in a similar place today. The moment that we, have, we repent and believe in, in Jesus and his death for us and his resurrection from the dead, we are forgiven by God. We are redeemed. We are God's people. We are secure and safe in God. But we're not in the, the new creation yet. I haven't received my resurrection body yet. We're still walking through life with the effects of sin and the fall. It's an in-between space, isn't it? But as we find in this chapter, it's not going to be time wasted, though. It's not time wasted. It's not superfluous. So our second point this morning, how God uses the desert time to teach his people. God uses the desert time to teach his people. So Israel, and this is the second time that they've been growling and grumbling since they uh, es- uh, entered the desert. And they're grumbling because, look, it just, it's the trip to Canaan, it's not taking a few hours. It's a long trip. They don't like the travel arrangements. They're complaining to God. Can you, you know, upgrade us? Can you do something about it? But you see, God is using this time in the desert to teach his people some important lessons. Verses 6 to 9. Uh, verse 6. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. Verse 8. Moses also said, You will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening. God is teaching them to know that he is God. This time in the desert is a time of discipleship or instruction, God teaching them that he is God. In fact, in uh, chapter 15, you might want to turn over to that, um, God tells the people explicitly what he's doing in this desert time. In uh, chapter 15 from verse 25, we read, The Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. He said, If you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. In other words, he is testing them. He is teaching them. All right, so the time in the desert, it's not just travel time getting from A to, to B, from one destination to another. It is a time given by God to teach his people, to disciple them, so that they will learn that he is truly God and what it means for them to be his people. God's going to show them, he's going to shape them to understand that we don't live by bread alone, but by trusting the words of God. You see, and that's what God does for us today. He's continuing because he loves us to teach us, to instruct us how we are to live. It's like training ground. It's the pre-season before the first match of the year. You know, it's what happens before any sporting season. You know, you go through months of training, the pre-season, and where the team is gathering and you're working out. Oh, that's the coach. That's the captain. These are the rules. This is how we're going to play together as a team. Yeah, I mean, yes, in the desert, this environment is tough. But God is with them. He will guide them. Friends, understand that the stuff of life is here in part to teach us. God teaching us that we may know he is God. God teaches us to live by faith. To trust God, believing him at his word. Thirdly, see how God graciously provides. 
So we read from verse 4. The Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in and that it is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. And down to verse 10. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. Verse 13, that evening quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. It's a wonderful passage, isn't it? God responds to their grumbling with grace. They're complaining, they're moaning, they're moping about. God responds with grace. Now, God's not caving into their demands. This is God showing kindness to a people whose attitudes and, and feelings keep on changing like the wind. One moment they're, on, they're hot and on fire for God. The next, everything's bad and poor me. This gracious God gives his presence and, and provision. Now, his presence is, it comes in the form of a, of a cloud. So by the day, uh, God will appear to them in, in, in a cloud and, and he will lead them by that. And it says, I am with you. And God will also provide food for them. He provides meat, quail. He provides bread that will come from heaven. And look what we're told about this bread from uh, verse 17. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, the one who gathered much did not have too much. And the one who gathered little did not have too little. In other words, God provides everything that they need. He is a a sufficient God. As the people go out each day, no one's gathering too much, no other one's gathering too little. Each has enough. But we also see, though, even as God is providing and uh, uh, with grace to their grumbling, some of the people are still not listening. They're not to store manna um, and keep it overnight, they're told that, apart from the night of the Sabbath. Um, but, but some people think, no, I know better than God. I'm going to collect more than I need. And, and so they hold on to the manna. And then in the morning, it, we're told it's filled up with maggots and it begins to smell. And they're also told in advance, no manna is going to come down on the Sabbath day. But some people think, oh, no, I'm going to go out and check. And they come out and they check it on the Sabbath morning. And then Moses says, how long will you not believe God? They are slow to learn, aren't they? But are we not also? But even as we hear this description of God's gracious provision, I suspect it reminds us of something Jesus taught, doesn't it? And we shouldn't be surprised to find lots of connections between uh, the Exodus stories and Jesus. And those links are deliberate. Because Jesus, even himself, repeatedly takes these Exodus themes and and he wants to show that those themes are ultimately pointing to him and are fulfilled in him. So, for example, the, the, the Lord's Prayer says this, Give us our daily bread. Give us our daily bread. I'm sure that the, the manna that's here in Exodus is what is on Jesus' mind. Give us today our daily bread. So very different how we're raised to live, isn't it? We're thinking and planning and saving for the next 40 years. And there's something wise about plan, planning, isn't there? But sometimes in, in our planning, there, there is an aspect of, I don't really trust God enough to provide for me tomorrow. And, and so I, I can't be generous today. Because of the plans that I've set for myself, which are, well, I may not see them into, for 30 years or in five years, but I can't afford to show patience today. Jesus teaches us to pray our Father, provide what we need this day. Provide what we need for our, our physical lives and our spiritual life today. Father, feed us. 
nourish us, grow us today. It's such an essential lesson for life, isn't it? And Jesus will go on in that Sermon on the Mount uh, to, to encourage us to focus, get, uh, get our focus right in life. He says, seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. And all these other things will be given to you as well. And all those other things that Jesus mean, is, is talking about, uh, uh, the, the clothes that we need, the food that we need to wear, uh, eat and, and so on. In other words, God knows your needs He knows our daily needs, our needs for food and clothing and shelter. But in the midst of all that, he says, seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. Keep your eyes on the main story. And we can trust God to provide for us today. Friends, God provided for us yesterday. God will provide today. It's how the universe is wired to work. Trust God each day for your daily needs, your physical, mental, spiritual needs. Now, there is one more thing going on in uh, Exodus chapter 16. Toward the end of the chapter, God commands the people to take some of the manna and to uh, put it inside a jar. And that jar is to be kept as a reminder for future generations. And, and the reminder is that, yeah, the Lord kept his people in the wilderness. The Lord provided for his people in the desert. And, and so the point of this remembrance is this. Remember God's gracious provision. Remember how gracious is God's gracious provision. Let me read from verse 31. The people of Israel called the bread manna. It was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey. Sounds pretty good. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Take an omer of manna and keep it for the generations to come so they can see the bread I gave you to eat in the wilderness when I brought you out of Egypt. So Moses said to Aaron, take a jar, put an omer of manna in it, then place it before the Lord to be kept for the generations to come. So that manna that fell from heaven each day was a daily reminder of God's promises and his provisions and his kindness to his people. And the manna, though, was always intended to be a temporary measure, so they're not getting manna when they uh, enter the promised land. So it was a temporary measure for those years in, in the wilderness. But God wanted all future generations to remember the manna. He wanted God's people to remember in the future his daily provisions for his people through the Exodus years. So there's manna that's kept in in a jar, and it's designed to do that, to have that effect. Now, I think similarly today, we we need reminders, don't we? Because just like Israel, we have a habit of forgetting. Our memory isn't always as sharp and clear focus as it needs to be. It's interesting that the the grumbling that was seen in Exodus is also seen in Jesus' day. Can you turn over to, uh, your, in your Bibles to John chapter 6 for a moment? It reinforces this idea of the connection between grumbling and memory and so forth. John chapter 6, I'm going to read from verse 40. So we had this passage read at the, the start of church this morning, didn't we? Verse 40, John chapter 6. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. At this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he say, I came down from heaven? So what we we discover is that the the condition that the Israelites were suffering in the desert is the same as what the people in Jesus' day are suffering. They're grumbling. They don't like what they hear from God. They don't believe and trust what God is saying. And immediately following this, this grumbling, notice what Jesus says. He makes this astonishing claim from the end of verse 47. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. 
Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Jesus is saying, I am the ultimate bread. As wonderful as God's gracious provision of manna in the, in the desert was for 40 years, Jesus is the true, the ultimate bread from heaven. He is the, the, the living manna. He is God's gracious provision that gives us life and hope and sustenance and joy. And as Jesus is explaining this most sublime truth ever told, and he begins to describe how he can be tasted and enjoyed and believed, and yet the people are grumbling. <coughs> They're grumbling. Friends, we mustn't do that. I was talking to a, a, a friend of mine uh, during the week who's pastoring in Perth, and uh, just talking about, uh, I think, a bit one of those pitfalls that we see in society at the moment, how Christians are becoming more polarised and divided and, and so on. And one of the things I said to him, that it's like as our culture is becoming increasingly divided and polarised and splitting along political lines and cultural lines, Christians are assuming that we have to join one of those camps, either that end or that end. And we would talk and we say, we need to wake up. Christians need to wake up and realise we do not belong to either extreme. We're not, we're not there on the right or on the left or we're, we're even in the middle. We are a people without a home in this world. As society gets pushed about by all these extremes and supposed middle bits, we think, I need to place myself here or find a home there. Friends, we are not at home anywhere in this world. We are not home. We are living in an in-between place. We are journeying home, but we're not there yet. And I think if we learn that lesson, it will free you from so many of the pressures and expectations that we put on ourselves or that our society puts on ourselves. And as much as I like to joke with my Sydney friends about, you know, Melbourne's a city on the hill and blah, 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 blah. It's not, is it? We're not a city flowing with milk and honey, maybe with coffee and bakeries and yum cha and a lot of good stuff, but it's not heaven. There is still so much sadness and sin and despair and pain and death. And most of the five million people who call Melbourne home are not interested in God. Often when we think of God, we are disgruntled and complain. And it's not like we're any better either. You know, one of the, the sharp truths that Exodus teaches us is this. Yes, Egypt deserved God's judgments. But we're also beginning to realize that the Israelites are just as bad. And yet God is showing them undeserved mercy and grace. And what God is doing is, is leading a stubborn, unbelieving people. And in love, he is teaching them. He's saying, I want you to know that I am God. I have rescued you to be my people. And just as God was telling the Israelites, keep some of that manna for posterity so that future generations will remember, we too need to remember. Yes, remember the story in Exodus, but even more so, remember what God has done for us in the Lord Jesus. It is such a wonderful antidote to grumbling and to nostalgia and memory loss. Never forget the gospel of Christ and what Jesus did for you on the cross. Every day you need to feed yourself with his words. Feed on him by faith, remembering God's words and believing them. Every day, give yourself time to eat his word, to chew on it, to allow the, the flavors and the aromas of the Lord Jesus to, to fill your senses. It is a wonderful antidote to grumbling and complaining and bitterness. 
Are you known, and Dan was talking about this with those illustrations at the start of the service, are you known by your friends as a bit of a, a, a groaner? I don't know, maybe your, your social media posts are always filled with what's wrong in the world and, and your conversations that you have with people always just turn to what's bad in life and what's going badly and poorly. Understand, friends, not does, that, that bitterness, bitterness doesn't only just eat away at you. It's leaving a bad taste in everyone else's mouth. Instead, remember the Lord Jesus. Feed on him in his word. I made a joke during the week about lettuce, and you've all seen it on the news, haven't you? The price of lettuce is going up in some supermarkets are selling, you know, a lettuce, iceberg lettuce for what, $10 or even $12 in some supermarkets now. It's become like a luxury food, hasn't it? Isn't it astonishing? Lettuce is a luxury food, and, and you know, rabbit food is so expensive now that KFC have dropped it out of their, their, their hamburgers. No, not hamburgers, what are they? They're chicken burgers. Astonishing. They're using cabbage. Anyway, I just don't know how that one's going to work. Anyway, speaking of luxury foods, um, the first time I, I, I still remember that the first time I, I ate a luxury food, uh, sometimes people refer to it as black fungus. Uh, it, it's truffle. I remember the first time I ever ate truffle. Susan was with me, and this is like decades ago, right? When people had kids, yeah, many, many years ago. And, and, and it was in a soup. You don't normally put truffle in a soup, but the, the chef did, and it was astonishing. It was like spectacular. That, that, you know, tr- truffle is a really pungent um, fungus, <laughs> it just smells a lot, but in this extraordinary way. And, and as we were just you know, um, lifting the, the, the soup to our, to our lips, and just you could just it just fills your, your nose, your your cavities, everything. And every mouthful was absolutely magical. Friends, we, because of God's grace to us, can feed on the Lord Jesus every day. Freely. And it is like nothing else. It is the food that will fill you. As you think about um, how the year is going at the moment, and I know as I talk to people in the congregation that uh, everyone has uh, different experiences and, and I feel as though they're in a different place. Some are just really struggling. Others are just steamrolling ahead and left uh, the pandemic behind and, and life is going pretty well at the moment. I wonder, in this in-between place, what is God teaching you at the moment about how to live for him as his people? What is God teaching you that you may know he is God? What are you learning in this season? Are you someone who is prone to grumbling? You find it rather cathartic. You like like to complain because you're never quite satisfied and maybe you think you're getting a raw deal. Please stop. It will consume you. Instead, turn to God. Taste and see that he is good. Let us pray, shall we? Father, you are the God who from heaven gave um, bread for your people to eat in the, in the wilderness. And Father, you are our God who has given us the, the living bread, your only son, who came from heaven and who died that death on the cross for us, who rose from the dead, that we might have eternal life. Father, please forgive us when we are prone to grumble and to complain and to think that we deserve better than what we have in life or to having that bad taste in our hearts that we we just kind of lingers there. Please, God, help us to repent and heal us as well. 
Help us to remember your goodness to us, your good word for us, the living bread that we can eat by faith and enjoy every day. And Father, we thank you that each day you do provide our daily needs. Help us to remember that how good and gracious you are to us. And Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.